Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit with that bold access that you've given us to give you all the glory, the thanks, and the praise for the love that you have for us. I just ask that you would filter out all that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We just moved into chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about love. It's a word that we throw around a lot today that um, has a whole lot of different meanings, and we're going to look at a very particular meaning uh, in our context here of spiritual graces, spiritual gifts. So I want to thank you again for joining us. I hope your day goes well. I want to begin by talking about uh, the fact that we, we tend to throw the word love around so loosely. You know, there's a, I've, I've mentioned this story before in the past uh, of, of how that I've known individuals who, who don't want anything to do with God, they don't want anything to do with the Bible. Uh, they're, I, I guess by uh, all, all uh, definition, they're, they're an atheist. And yet, their response to me uh, concerning love is that, well, we just need to love one another. Just love one another. You know, we don't need all the rest of that. Just love, 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 love one another. And uh, I'm sorry to have to inform them that they stole that phrase from the Bible. Love is very unique to Christianity. All of the other major religions, uh, I think there's, uh, you know, like 25 to some people say up to 30 major religions. I know there's about 25 officially recognized religions that, that uh, in which you don't see what we're about to look at today. You know, uh, Buddha doesn't love, love, uh, the, the uh, followers of Buddhism don't love Buddha. You know, Buddha certainly doesn't love them. Muhammad certainly doesn't love Muslims and so on and so forth. It is that unique to Christianity. Uh, we're looking at a word that is not to be thrown around loosely. So the unbelieving world has basically stolen the word from the Bible. And uh, the, the biblical definition of love is the, the giving of oneself for the ultimate good of another, expecting nothing in return. That's the, the strict biblical definition. So we're at chapter 13, which is considered to be the, the classic passage of Scripture on love. And some days ago, I, I pointed out that there were roughly 25 recognized religions in the world. You know, there's really more than that. Uh, but, you know, these, these are the officially recognized religions of which 12 of those are considered to be major uh, because they represent the largest population groups. And in none of those, except Christianity, is the concept of love ever present. Uh, I'd like for you to take a moment to, to turn to 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. All of those other religions, you know, it's God and his subjects. Christianity, it's God and his sons. And that's why Christianity ain't a religion. You know, uh, most Christians today will tell you that. It's not a religion. It's a relationship between a father and his children. And that relationship is a relationship of strong love. And folks, that is absolutely foreign to any of the other religions in the world. Now look at 1 John uh, chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not 
knoweth not God, for God is love. It is, uh, it's typical among Arminians, and, uh, and particularly many of the Bible teachers, they'll declare that almost as though it's a great piece of news that there's one thing that God can't do, and that is He cannot make you love Him. You know, that, that opens a, an entire door of, of biblical foolishness. Now, you can be a little bit proud that you decided to love him. You know, he can't make you love him, so it's something that you do by your own will. And yet, here is a clear statement of Scripture that those who love God have been born and that is a perfect passive. It's, it's in the Greek. That's the grammar. Uh, something completely done in past time, not done by the individual at all. They were born of God. They're His children. Of course He made them love Him. Of course He did. Because He redeemed them. But if we go down to the bottom of the chapter, 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. The reason, folks, that you love him is because he first loved you. And so it's just plain wrong to suggest that God cannot make you love him when that's exactly what he did. And we rejoice in the fact that we have been born of God. Verse 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. It's because God loved you. He loved you when you did not love Him, when you were His enemy when you were in opposition to him, when you were far from him, when you were that prodigal son in the far country, he loved you. He always loved you. And if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Love is unique to Christianity. Now back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. What I am seeing, folks, is that these first three verses seem to cover all of the gifts that we looked at in chapter 12. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, that is love, that's agape, love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could move mountains or remove mountains and have not love I'm nothing I am nothing and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I I give my body to be burned and have not love it profits me nothing Those are very sobering words, folks. And I've already, I've already tipped my hand that I believe all of those gifts have ceased, but that's just me. Well, I think all of those are covered in these first three verses. Now, let me ask you something. Dearly beloved, how in the world could you preach the truth of Jesus Christ without love? You know, we could spend a, a lot of time academically on the fact that he's God and very God. That he's a creator of heaven and earth. And all of these things would mean nothing if we didn't know that he loves us with an everlasting love that is so great that he died in our place. He died as our substitute. 
And that's the love that we're to have. That's why it's called, I believe that's why it's called the greatest gift of all, the greatest grace, the word there, gift is garis, grace. And if I have all of those gifts mentioned and I don't have that love, I'm nothing. It's not true service. It's not true worship. It, it, if, in fact, it, what it is, is it's a life laboring heavily for nothing, working hard for nothing, brought about by not knowing how much God loves me. If I don't have that love, that articulated, definite article, that love, God says I have nothing. I profit nothing. You know, there's two expressions there in our text. You know, in our context, we profess to be doing this for God. You know, that's law keeping. We're not under law, but grace. You know, the fruit bearing subject of him working through us by faith, you know, him being the vine, we being the branches, you know, is far different from just a mere reading it and doing it mentality. You know, it's him producing in us what we couldn't possibly do ourselves and it be profitable. You know, I give my body to be burned as a sacrifice, but if I, if I don't have love, there's no profit in it. There's no reason for doing it. Doing it. And now verse 4 begins with the definite article. The love. The love. The love that suffers long. The love endures long in situations that it can't control. The love is kind. The love does not envy. The love does not boast in itself. The love is not puffed up, is not proud. Beginning with verse 4, on with the love. I'm going to suggest that we are looking at the love of God referred to in 1 John that is revealed in us because he loves us. I, uh, I, I don't know how to emphasize the concept that God is the initiator. God loved us, folks, before we knew him. He loved us when we were, we were his enemies. We, in the flesh, were God's enemy. The flesh has always been at enmity with God. You know, we know what the works of the flesh are. They're, they're shown to us in Galatians. The works of the flesh are all evil. We've been looking at that which is spiritual here, okay? There are no works of God in the flesh, folks. Those that are in the flesh can't please God. And, and this love that we're talking about, God's love suffers long. It suffers long. You, you know, folks, that you sin against him every day. What I deserve is hell. There, there is no argument and there's no appeal. That's what I earned. That's what I deserve, but he loves me. He always has. He, he loved me long before I ever knew that he loved me and to stand up and suggest that there's something wonderful in the fact that God can't make you love him well, that, that, that gives you a tremendous platform for self-praise. I, in my own will, in my own choice, decided to love God. Well, aren't I nice? Why do I love God? Because he first loved me. While I was in opposition to him and hated him, and there was nothing good in me at all. He loved me and he took my hell and he gave me his glory. In my case, he suffered long. You know, some of you may not live that long. But in my case, he suffered long and, was, and he was always kind. The love is kind. No, I'm not suggesting that there isn't a model here for us. I think you ought to do that. And I think you ought to you ought to do that because God did it for you. And and I believe the the definite article, the articulated love, 
is God's example and a good one for you know us to follow. Behold what manner of love he has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. You know, you just say God loves you more than he loves me. No, there's no envy, folks, in true love. There's no envy in the love. And there's no glorying, boasting in the love. There's no pu being puffed up in the love. It's the love mentioned here. God never did that. And God simply tells us that we ought to love him because he first loved us. There's no holes in God's love for us. I know, I know over the years I've, you know, I have, I have actually, I've spent time with Christians who were not confident that God even loved them. Dearly beloved, if God does not love one of his children, then he lied. This love exemplified by God does not behave itself unseemly. It doesn't seek its own glory. It's not easily provoked. And it thinks no evil. I'm sure God must see the, the flaws, the, the holes in, you know, in our lives. He must see the errors. He must see the sin. But he says he's washed us white as snow, whiter than snow. He's removed our sin, cast it as far as, far as the east is from the, the west, buried it in the depths of the sea to be remembered no more. By his death on the cross, he presented you before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. That, that's the love that thinks no evil. God does not think evil toward you, folks. I don't know how to emphasize that because so many times over the years, People have tried to figure out why, why God's doing what he's doing in their lives. And the answer always has to be because I love you. Why are things wrong? Why do you suffer? Why do you fail? Because he loves you. Dearly beloved, what do you have if you don't have love? The love. Everything God does in our lives is to bring glory to Him. We, we may want it to bring glory to us, but it, it's to bring glory to God. Verse 6, the love that's exemplified in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in truth. Iniquity is the works of the flesh. That human merit-based ideology, that mentality. There's no rejoicing in, in, in iniquity. The, the love doesn't do that. God is love. God rejoices in us as new creations in Christ. Are we rejoicing in what he's rejoicing in? That he's put away our sin? We have this wonderful relationship with God as new creations in Christ and earthen vessels. Why? In order that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. God designed it that way. He designed it so that the excellency of the power is not of us, not in us, not our ability, can't be done in an earthen vessel. This is a spiritual, we've been, for several weeks, we've been looking at a spiritual context here. What a marvelous thought to be with the one who loved me. Always loved me. Never failed to love me. And, and, and that love never changed no matter what I did. No matter how much I sinned, it never changed. It's, it's difficult to comprehend because love, as we experience it in in human relationships does change. But folks, he loves me as much when I'm in the depths of sin as he does 
when I'm in relationship with Him and the study of His Word, He loves me. The love bears all things. It believes all things. It, it hopes all things. And it endures all things. So it's present in every aspect of our life to bear and to endure and to believe and to hope because it never fails. That's our God. It never comes to an end. But, whether prophecies, they shall fail, tongues, they shall cease, knowledge, vanish away, and, and that opens up a whole, you know, I don't know, Pandora's box of questions and I've already suggested that that covers the content of chapter 12. And now we come to verses 8 and 9. Okay, we, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that's, I believe is the word of God, then that which is in part shall be done away. It makes sense to me. You know, the popular position uh, particularly conservative uh, Bible colleges and seminaries and uh, any of the conservative writings and articles and commentaries is that the signed gifts ceased and, and the other gifts didn't and, and I've already suggested that. I think, I think in the context that we're in now all of the gifts of chapter 12 all of those gifts in chapter 12 and all of the ones spoken here have ceased and there are I don't know, there are probably 20, 30 different opinions as to what that means. Uh, I picked out 12 that I'm going to talk about, I, I hope to talk about. Uh, 12 of the, of the, what I would consider the, the prominent ones, and the Lord willing, we'll discuss those next time. Uh, we're going to ha have a lot of fun in, uh, in 8, 9, and 10. Be whole what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. For many, the, the glory and the majesty of the sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth has blinded their eyes to the grace of this God who not only is the one true God, but is actually decreeing and controlling every single event in his creation as well as every detail and in every event in our lives dearly beloved is it reasonable not is it not is it not un, is it not unreasonable to believe that the god of eternity who so loved us that he that he gave his only begotten son to become man be made sin and die in our place, die as our substitute so that we are made the righteousness of God in Him, that the God who paid such a price, which was the death of His Son for us, that He would leave us to our own devices. The same God who deals with the immensity of His creation is the God who numbered the hairs of our heads. He doesn't have to count too far in my case, or you know, as, not as much as he used to in the past. You know, from the movements of, of far off galaxies to, to the, the fall of a sparrow, our God is in absolute control of every event and every detail in his creation, as well as every event and every detail of our lives. Stop and think for a moment. It cost God nothing to create billions of stars, galaxies. But because of his love for us, it cost him the life of his only begotten son to redeem us. And so it is inconceivable that God, after paying such a price for us, would leave the simplest detail in our lives to, to fickle fate, the wiles of the devil, or the, or the decisions of our finite mind.
Well, I hope this will serve as somewhat of an introductory chapter, uh, introductory, you know, video for uh, moving into chapter 13, which is a, a no less marvelous a chapter as all the rest. I love you all I, dearly. I truly do. Rest in him. Thank you for all of your love, your prayers, your support. Please pray for one another. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.